Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. This week, in a season of short days and early darkness, uh, we are going to center on the topic of the divine child. One way, mythologically, all over the world, and certainly in the Christmas season of the Western world, something new and numinous comes into the world. There is the light celebration of Hanukkah, of solstice, of something new where the light comes back into the world just at the time, mythologically, that the sun makes its great turning and our days get just a little longer. So uh, this is a huge topic, as we have found. We're going to try to circumambulate as many of the meanings and facets and mythological uh, references as possible around the divine child. Yeah, this is such a common archetype. It's found in just about every culture. And the mythology around it is quite similar often, which uh, is very moving, I think, to notice these themes and story after story across time and place. There's truly something universal being spoken about here and being imaged. What I'm particularly appreciating is the opposites that come together over and over again in the myth of the divine child, uh, from Ganesha to Moses to Jesus, that the divine child is always born into difficulty, persecutory uh, situation uh, in the case of Moses, where Pharaoh was uh, persecuting young Hebrew children, and he gets placed in the basket in the bulrushes to be adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, in the case of Ganesha, uh, his head gets chopped off and replaced with an elephant's head. Uh, so it represents a union of maybe the instinctual and unconscious and the self with the body. And of course, in the story of Jesus, he's born in a manger because there was no room at the inn. And then again, the persecutory myth comes in with uh, Herod uh, persecuting all the children who were under two years old and the flight into Egypt. Mm. And and those stories that we could just go on and on and yes. come up with other examples. Uh, Krishna, there's been a prophecy that uh, Devaki's children will be the downfall of uh, his uncle. And so there's, you know, all of her children are being killed and she has to swap Krishna out to save him. And of course, Kronos, the father of Zeus, is told that his one of his children will surpass him, and so he swallows all of his children until um, 
Rhea is able to save uh, Zeus. And and Jung talks about this. We're going to be referencing frequently today, I think, Jung's really extraordinary essay on the psychology of the child archetype. It's just kind of jaw-dropping, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, jaw-droppingly brilliant. And, and, and he lifts this up. He says, the motifs of insignificant exposure, abandonment, danger, etc., try to show how precarious is the psychic possibility of wholeness. That is, the enormous difficulties to be met with attaining this highest good. So he's talking here about the child, the divine child archetype as an image of a potential wholeness in the psyche. And these dangers that you're talking about, Deb, are symbolic expressions of how difficult it is to undergo this process of individuation. Jung further says, these dangers also signify the powerlessness and helplessness of the life urge, which subjects every growing thing to the law of maximum self-fulfillment, while at the same time the environment influences place all sorts of insuperable obstacles in the way of individuation. So we are all that divine child trying to reach toward wholeness against seemingly impossible odds. And in all the myths of the divine child that I think we'll be talking about, the child constellates as a compensation to something that has gone awry in the world, the world psychic, the world political. Jesus constellates, is born in order to resolve the original sin of Genesis and restore the divine and the material. Krishna is born to save the world from this growing evil that threatens to destroy all life. Dionysus seems to be born to save the Greek psyche from the overwhelming rationalism of that culture and regulation. And so in our own psyches, and it's not uncommon to dream, suddenly I I have a baby and I'm in charge of this baby and I don't even know how it happened. Much like Mary's sense of shock. (laughs) (laughs) And there's a decision. What does this mean? How am I going to care? But if we look at the archetype, how is the dream baby a medicine, the needed miraculous appearance in order to write something in the inner world? Yes, Joseph. And in that sense, the child can also be an image of the transcendent function. And Jung says the transcendent function is the irrational way that a seemingly insoluble problem can be resolved when we hold the opposites. So the child is born from the opposites of male and female. And in our psyche, when there's an, you know, a conflict that can't be resolved with a rational function, sometimes the answer is birthed spontaneously from the unconscious as, as a child. And that's the way it's imaged. And Joseph, I'm so glad you brought this up about dreams because this is extraordinarily common in dreams. Yes. And I think we should maybe spend a few minutes and talk about dream babies. <laughs> okay. What I'm back on uh, the the literal baby and how uh, we often receive the news of something new gestating in the psyche whether it's a dream baby or or anything else, it's very with very great degrees of ambivalence of, I'm not so sure about this. And in uh, the Christian story, the angel says, greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Ah, wait a minute here. And then he says, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God And now you will conceive in your room and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, reign over the house of Jacob, and there will be no end to his kingdom. And Mary says, well, wait a minute, how can this, how can this be? I'm not so sure about this at all. And the angel says, oh, nothing will be impossible with God. 
And finally, Mary says, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. But the news of of the new thing is not always just unambivalently welcome. No, and that often comes up in paintings of the Annunciation. That that is one of my favorite subjects in art, actually. Me too. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that about you, Lisa. Mm. And and there are there are some where she looks absolutely horrified. Yeah. <laughs> so yes. That might be you know sort of a, a byproduct of uh, medieval painting techniques. But there's some where she looks like what? I'm going to do what? <laughs> And I think that's part of it. I think Mm -hmm. that is part of what makes it so special and so numinous is that it it calls us into a confrontation with ourselves and the inner conflict that the birth of something new entails. Mm -hmm. So, So let's talk for a few minutes about how this does show up in dreams. I mean, there certainly are dreams where people have an, an enunciation moment, right? Where they, they learn that they're pregnant in the dream. And there often is a sort of like, wait a minute, what? I mean, and this can happen to, to women who've never had children, to women who've had lots of children. This can happen to men. Men have these dreams too. It's like, I just found out I was pregnant. <laughs> And then oftentimes it's so, so common for people, for all people again, to have dreams that suddenly I have a a baby. And oftentimes one of the features of these dreams is that the baby is endangered or the baby is ill or the baby isn't doing well. And the dream ego has to figure out how to take care of the baby or realizes that he or she isn't taking very good care of the baby. You know, um, I mean, there's just example after example of that in my, in my own practice, and, and it is this sense that uh, there's this new psychic content, and we can talk a little bit more about that in a second, and how are we relating to it, and what are our feelings about it? And when the inner baby has a certain numinosity about it, there can be a threat. I mean, Herod's murder of the innocents yes. was born of his terror that something greater than himself had hit the scene and was at threat to depose him. So when we dream of having a baby, whether a male or female, but there it is in our arms, we can begin to get the feeling that I'm not in charge of my life right now and something is being brought forth, whether or not I like it. And of course, if we can find the way to welcome it, the path to change can be celebrated, and many times people ambivalently tread the path. Joseph, I really like the language that you used, because one of the things that's true about a child is that uh, in, in most instances, a child will outlive us. A child will surpass us. So in a dream sense, symbolically, it is an image of something that will overcome the ego, as it were, that will um, surpass us. And Jung talks in the beautiful passage about the futurity of the child archetype. And I'm going to just read it because it's one of my favorite, favorite parts. He says, one of the essential features of the child motif is its futurity. The child is potential future. Hence, the occurrence of the child motif in the psychology of the individual signifies as a rule an anticipation of future developments, even though at first sight it may seem like a retrospective configuration. Life is a flux, a flowing into the future, and not a stoppage or a backwash. It is therefore not surprising that so many of the mythological saviors are child gods. This agrees exactly with our experience of the psychology of the individual, which shows that the child paves the way for a future change of personality. Now, when we talk about change of personality, it sounds very tidy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And when we think about a New Year's resolution, which is interestingly often happens, you know, right around the solstice. And is imaged by a baby. And is imaged by a baby. We all know that trying to change the personality, let alone experiencing a substantial change of personality, it uh, it can bring on a little bit of tumult. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. 
the road to fulfillment, to self-realization or individuation is fraught with dangers. The baby is small, vulnerable, weak, helpless, and is often either persecuted or abandoned or exposed uh, to the elements, but at the same time, divinely powerful. And I think that goes to what you just read, Lisa, of how powerful the image of the child is for futurity, of that there is a road ahead, psyche is going somewhere, but our conscious selves and our vulnerable selves, our shadows, we're going to have to walk the walk, and the path is difficult. I want to go back to dreams for just a second, because when someone comes in with the dream of a baby, and perhaps it's a vulnerable baby, and they're, you know, they've, you know, I suddenly realize I left the baby in the closet, <laughs> or something like that. It happens all the time. Yes, <laughs> in dreams. <laughs> You know, it's like, okay, so what's the new attitude or the new content that you're not tending to very well uh, might be one way to explore that. But the other thing that comes up with children in dreams, children or babies in dreams, is the link to the past, which is also something that Jung talks about. So if someone suddenly dreams of, you know, I have a, a three-year-old child. I'll say, well, what happened three years ago? What was born in you three years ago? And that can often be uh, really illuminating. The other question is, and what were you like at three? So the child connects us with the past. And um, Jung says the child motif represents the preconscious childhood aspect of the collective psyche. The child is an image of our original wholeness, and it can serve to reconnect us with this. So oftentimes as we grow up, we forget aspects of ourselves. We cut things off that may be an essential aspect. And the image of the child as it shows up in dreams or even in mythology is a reminder of this. It can be a, a symbol uh, that acts as a compensatory element in the psyche to an overdeveloped yes. consciousness yes. Mm -hmm. that we get caught up with our, our daily lives and what we need to do and uh, making the mortgage payment and uh, all the rest of it. And the numinosity of the preconscious wholeness newness and fresh vision for the world is often represented by a baby of where do I go back to my essential roots, back to a new beginning that's not entirely ego-oriented or ha has to do with my conscious planning. And, and Jung writes, rich religious observances, the retelling and ritual repetition of a mythical event, meaning the birth of the child, consequently serve the purpose of bringing the image of childhood and everything connected with it again and again before the eyes of the conscious mind so that the link with the original condition may not yes. be broken. Mm -hmm. When an Alessand's dream of inner babies or inner infants, one of the things that I try to resist is determining what the baby means. It seems to me that an inner baby, just like an outer baby, requires a long-term sustained curiosity and patience. Mm. That when a baby arrives, we may become aware of our fantasies, of what we hope the baby will be, who they will be, the talents that they'll yeah. bring. But actually only observing the baby and tending to it can allow us to recognize what is being revealed. Yeah. So I find that sometimes if people have a baby dream and, you know, in that 20 minutes they decide, oh, you know, it means, you know, I'm starting a new job. <laughs> and then there's a foreclosure mm -hmm. around the baby and often the image will slip back into the unconscious. But if I can encourage people to think of it as if it was a real baby mm -hmm. that requires a lot 
of observation, maybe 21 years of observation <laughs> or more <laughs> or more that you're thinking, oh, that's who that is. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. Or that's what that potential is. So I take dreams of babies really seriously. And I'll often even make a note in my calendar at least a year ahead of time to make sure that I ask about the baby hmm. at, its, at its anniversary, just to make sure it doesn't disappear. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, I like that image uh, very much, that a baby is full of meaning and full of potential without imposing on it what that potential is. So you, the image of tending and helping it, whatever that creative potential is, helping it to realize itself it is vital, I think. So I'm feeling like we could pivot a little bit back into mythology. And it can be so rich to take sacred text, which perhaps religiously we take literally, but to put a mythic lens on it so that we can also look for metaphors and ways to personalize the stories. In the ancient Greek world, the myth of Dionysus was a very, very profoundly influential myth, and for them, a religious reality. The most powerful cult of Dionysus was called the Orphic cult, and there was a mix or a Hellenistic mix of several different myths of Orpheus and Dionysus and Phanes and several other things. But in their telling of the myth, Persephone, who is the daughter of Zeus was spirited away by her mother into a cave. Zeus, who is drawn by Persephone's beauty and fertility, comes to her in the form of a mighty serpent and impregnates her. She gives birth to the Orphic version of Dionysus. Hera is full of rage, as she often was when uh, Zeus would father progeny outside of the marriage. She sets the Titans, who are the ancient, primordial, and instinctive gods of the world, against Dionysus and tasks them with killing him. The Titans set up a small campfire near the cave opening, and when Dionysus toddles out to play, they roll a single ball in his direction, and intrigued by that, he takes the ball, rolls it back to them, and trundles after it. The titans, or the size of mountains, grab Dionysus and tear him into pieces, and roast his flesh, and begin to eat it. The heart of Dionysus has been cast aside as inedible. Athena has been watching and creeps around through the bushes, taking the heart of Dionysus into a basket and bringing it back to Zeus, who slits an opening in his thigh and tucks the heart in there, sews it up, and allows it to gestate there for another birth. He is so enraged by the Titans that he gathers his lightning bolts and strikes them dead. A great steam issues up from them, and they are turned to ash. And from that ash, Zeus forms the first human beings, who are an amalgam of the instinctive, primordial violence of the Titans and the divine child Dionysus. Dionysus gestates in the thigh of Zeus and is born, protected, and kept safe. As he moves into the world, Hera still pursues him and strikes him down with madness. Wandering through the ancient world, destroying cities in a wild, drunken violence, his grandmother, Rhea, finally calls him into her cave, the place where he was first born, and initiates him into the Eleusinian mysteries of death and rebirth. 
the mysteries of Persephone and the underworld, and when he emerges, he wears women's clothing. Having been initiated into women's mysteries, his sanity is returned. And in the ancient world, every spring with the first blades of grass that would rise, the birth of Dionysus, or the Zoe of Dionysus, the life force of Dionysus, was seen literally and figuratively in the rising of the grass. So the divine child here, and Dionysus as he's described in later myths, is the god of, irrash of irrationality. He is the god who can tolerate being dismembered, tortured, um, set against unbelievable traumatic odds, and yet some central archetypal core in the divine child, in its heart, allows the personality to regenerate again and again. And I would submit that the heart of the divine child is in fact the archetype of the divine child. And that when we have access to that archetype, that force, that we too are able to survive unimaginably dismembering sufferings, both psychologically and physically and circumstantially, and regenerate a personality that is in fact intact. That was beautiful, Joseph. Yeah. Did you ever write anything on that? Oh, <laughs> it sounds like a thesis I might have written. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, such a story of the evolving interactions, conflicts, challenges of unconscious and consciousness, and the inherent urge of the heart, our divine center, uh, to realize itself against all odds. Mm. It's also a very sobering story about the titanic forces in our own psyche yes. and in the culture. Oh, yes. That when when our inner baby is born, which could be the idea that you're going to write a book or you're going to you know move to Zurich and become an analyst <laughs> or any a number of truly organic ideas because human beings are part titan in that myth, we are always standing against the savage dismembering power that is brought forward by envy mm -hmm. that wants to shred the emerging inside of us and sometimes to shred and dismember the emergent new born ideas of other people. Right. There's this urge to keep it small to not let the new thing grow. It can show up even in eating disorders with this attack on the body itself, the dismembering of sensation, the dismembering of the physical body through treating it very, very badly. Now, sometimes the Titans just win, and we really do destroy our life mission or destroy an unbelievably life-giving idea inside of us. I remember, I remember Jim Hollis saying that we all murder our children. Mm. Wow! And I, I think that's, I think that's true. We all murder our psychic children at one time or another, and I think that's what you're lifting up, Joseph. There is a shadow here uh, because we're talking about the archetype, and archetypes have a light and a darker side. And in the myth of Dionysus that you just retold, Joseph, the, there is again and again these deaths of Dionysus um, and his ability to resurrect, to reconstitute, to persevere. And, and so I'm thinking that that's our task, that we, we do fall. There are these deaths of our, our inner potentials or divine children, and hopefully— uh, like Dionysus, we can stay on the road and become more whole. And that the heart of the divine child or the nascent idea that wants to be born through you 
requires help. That if Athena had just not been there, Mm -hmm. if the heart had just truly just been discarded, it's hard to know what might have happened. The other titanic battle that we experience as Jungians all the time is the titanic dismembering power of the rational, of the ego, versus the life-giving, irrational, intuitive, spiritual input from the unconscious. And analysis is always involving standing before the titans and negotiating, pushing back. Every time a client comes in and brings us a dream and says, oh, this is stupid. I don't want to talk about it. But, you know, you asked me to write one down. Or they feel <laughs> irritated. I mean, I have I, I certainly work with clients and they really just refuse. They just kept saying dreams were stupid, that they're not going to write them down. And the products of the irrational life are are regularly attacked in this culture and probably worse so in this hyper-rational Greek culture as well. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I'm really picking up on what you said about Athena and how important it is that there be others often imaged as uh, other people or a goddess like Athena. And in the Christian story, it's the shepherds and the wise men. But as functions of our inner selves, of those who come to adore, uh, to adore the the newborn baby, and it's uh, really lovely to remember that part of it is also important. That evokes the image of the Pieta, that as Christ was being crucified in that story, and as his body was cast down from the cross, who gathered the heart, who took it unto herself, is often the two Marys yeah. that were there. And that image of the Magdalene, much like the image of Athena and the basket, cradling this thing that neither of them are sure is could come back to life. Mm-hmm. Neither are sure what's going to be done with the residue after the death, mm. but they store it in a container, Zeus's thigh or the borrowed grave, and it is tended, waiting mm. for a miraculous, inexcusable, uh, not inexcusable, but inexplicable birth mm-hmm. out of somebody's thigh or breaking out of the tomb yeah. um, mm-hmm. happening in in an inexplicable way. Yeah, that's beautiful. And how do we need to do that Mm -hmm. for ourselves and for each other? What do we need to tend? You know, this, this content is so profound and so multifaceted and so numinous. I mean, I think, I think we're all just feeling really moved by it. And I'm aware that when we are actually a mother the numinosity of the experience of having life come through you into the world, literally. And then, you know, the experience of childbirth or or having that baby, this same numinosity can be constellated. And I think is for, for most women who have this experience, Uh, you know, especially when we have an infant, you know, there's just, you know, I just couldn't stop staring at her. You know? <laughs> um, and and it, it is so incredibly numinous. But I'm also thinking that there's a way that even as our children age, we can tend to project divine child onto our children. And that can be a, a, a really wonderful thing, but it can have a shadow element as well. One of the ways I I definitely see that in analysis is when a young person becomes sexual and often the image of your child as the divine child and your image of your child getting on the back of a car feel really not congruent often, you know, it can create a real short circuit, you know, in the caregivers and the parents. The tendency or the potential a danger is when parents project 
their own unlived lives, their own hopes, perhaps unfulfilled hopes, aspirations, what have you, onto a child who is then an extension of the parent versus helping that child come into being as his or her unique self. I'm thinking of something even a little different, though, because I'm thinking about the tendency to project a real, truly archetypal content on the child, which would be to see the child literally as, uh, well, not literally, but, but to have the child infused with this kind of divine aspect. And I think this does happen for parents sometimes where we see our children as extremely spe special. And th that's kind of supported in the culture sometimes uh, with, um, you know, this notion that was popular some number of years ago of indigo children. Yeah. These children that are meant for a special destiny. There can be this way that we perhaps overvalue our children. And that can actually cultivate narcissism in the mm -hmm. child. I think that that is absolutely true. And I think of narcissistic character structures can have a divine child component to it. It can have a, a titanic, demanding, devouring element to it. It can carry that and other values. But when I see adults who are still over-identified with the divine child, mm -hmm. they'll walk around sometimes in a very alluring euphoria that the world is just endlessly amazing and splendid and extraordinary. And as we listen, that all the extraordinary events always circle around them, or the extraordinary event is initiated by them. So it might sound like, I had the most amazing day. I mean, it, it was beautiful. And I was, I walked into this tiny little town and, and then I looked into a, a coffee shop and somebody looked at me and I could feel the energy that they were giving me. And I walked in and it was as if something was rolling through me. And then it was like everybody in the coffee shop was somehow looking there at the counter. And I felt this joy rolling through me. It's very exalted, very sure that they are, mm -hmm. you know, sunlight as they're moving mm -hmm. through. And then there is a, uh, a devaluation or dismissing of things that are not congruent with the idea that their very presence is a gift to all concerned. Yeah. There's an ethereal component uh, that doesn't feel like the person is just grounded in an embodied way uh, and in the ordinariness of life and hasn't developed a kind of muscularity to have agency in the world and have some of the nitty gritty stuff of, of humanity. It's like when we, when we stay identified with the divine child, it's like we grow up to be a big baby. Exactly. And the, and that's, there's a weakling aspect to that of that the person can't be positively powerful, effective and get his or her hands dirty or his or her feet wet in the so in the real world because of this identification with something more ethereal and quote divine but it's a really kind of artificial aspect or interpretation of of specialness that's not truly divine yes that instead of a renewal of soul it inhabits the ego it merges with the ego mm -hmm. and then the levels are confused so we definitely can move through an imaginal world and feel that we are full of light. And that's an important imaginal experience. Mm -hmm. But when then we try to force the environment to reflect that or to carry that into the workplace, it becomes just really complicated. One of the interesting things that happens around the divine child is if people suddenly come into an enormous amount of money, Maybe they have an unexpected inheritance or a trust fund or won a lottery or, you know, an overwhelmingly large bonus. And then they talk about the fantasies. And many of the fantasies sound like the divine child. I'm not going to ever lift a finger again. 
I'm quitting my job immediately. I'm going to hire people to do everything for me. And then as the fantasy unfolds, quite literally, they imagine they're just going to kind of live on an amazing couch. People are going to tuck little bits of food in their (laughs) mouth and rub their feet, which is, you know, like being a divinely attended baby. And, And many people in the back are thinking, that's the good life. And it's very seductive. Yeah, it is. Whereas really, in contrast to this kind of uh, fantasy, and there are people who can live this kind of fantasy, the divine child is really meant to initiate the individuation process. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, And that's a struggle. And I think we see it in uh, the mythological material we've uh, referenced of Dionysus and Moses and the story of Jesus and what we want to become as whole human beings and be in service to the divine, not be identified with it, but have a meaning and a purpose where something meaningful can come into the world through us for the future of Mm -hmm. other people who will follow along just by virtue of our presence and our influence on them. You know, I'm not thinking that people have to write Shakespearean plays or be artistic geniuses, but that's the journey is the Mm -hmm. divine comes into the world through us. We, We are not it. Mm -hmm. This reminds me very much of the religions that sprung up around Krishna, that one of the teachings of Krishna is karma yoga, that in the pre-Krishna world, the caste system was very, very rigid. You were either kind of born into a higher spiritual opportunity or through mistakes you'd made, born into terrible circumstances. But Krishna brought forward as an avatar of Vishnu, that all people could achieve enlightenment. And what they would have to practice and understand is that every action is dedicated to Krishna. The result of every action comes from Krishna. The impulse to initiate anything comes from Krishna. And so by seeing the face of the divine in the impulse, in the action, and in the results, good or bad results, by the way, is the face of the divine, then the ego is in a state of constant reference to the self Mm -hmm. without feeling that one is inflated. Mm -hmm. Yes. So being in right relationship with this archetypal energy is uh, grounding, but also expansive but if we over-identify it too much, either as ourselves or, or kind of project that onto our children, it can get us into trouble and actually be stultifying. I'm wanting to just uh, touch again into this experience of motherhood and how I think that part of the reason that motherhood can be such a tremendous growth opportunity is because of the numinous quality of the divine child and how that archetype gets constellated in the process of mothering. So it really kind of puts you in touch with that thin veil between the worlds when you give birth to a child. It opens you up to these enormous archetypal energies. It, it, you have just played the role of creatrix. Mm. And in that sense, uh, you know, been goddess-like. I mean, you have given birth to new life, which is an amazing thing. And all of this gets activated in the psyche of a woman who becomes a mother and kind of seeds the ground with these enormous potentials for personal growth and deepening into this. And I do talk about this in my book that will be coming out in uh, May of 2021. Yeah, that's right. I worked in a little promotional. Uh, (laughs) And it is available for pre-order. It's called Motherhood, Facing and Finding Yourself. 
And you know what, Lisa, this too is a divine child that has been Mm -hmm. long gestating for almost as long as I've known you. Uh, So we are all celebrating this impending birth and promoting it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The declaration, you know, the annunciation. um, Yes, exactly. mm -hmm. Three kings are going to show up at the book signing. (laughs) But I also, um, you know, having given birth to children some time ago, but it, it is um, an amazing experience. I always hope that every mother uh, has that experience that is so well represented in the story around Christmas and the birth of Jesus of no matter what the circumstances, how difficult or unexpected or anything else that um, in that moment, there is the realization that this is the divine child. My child is the divine child. Deb, would you like to read the passage from Luke that describes the birth? I think this is such a a really beautiful and archetypal story. While the time they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people, To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah and the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what they had, where they had been and told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. I would hope this experience that has been so beautifully recorded in the Gospel of Luke is very much a universal experience, something that can live in all our hearts as the arrival in a miraculous way of what is new, what has been blessed, what has been given, as the start of a new beginning, a new beginning in our hearts and a new beginning for the potential that all of us have uh, for becoming what we were innately meant to be. And with that, maybe we can pivot into a dream. Hi, this is Lisa from This Union Life Podcast. Joseph, Deb, and I have been deeply moved by your responses to our work. Producing, editing, and distributing the podcast involves substantial expenses, and we need your help. Please stop by our website, thisunionlife.com, and click on the heading, Be Our Patron. You'll be redirected to our Patreon funding page. Patreon helps creators connect with people who believe in projects like ours. There, you can sign up with your credit card to support us for as little as a dollar a month, and at higher levels of support, we'll provide special episodes, behind-the-scenes photos and stories, and a chance to join a select pool of listeners for dream interpretations. Thank you. Today, our dreamer is a 32-year-old male. He is a therapist and veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan war. 
and here's his dream. I am perched high on a cliff, looking down on a horrifyingly beautiful sight. There is a rugged coastline with clear blue water that is inexplicably and immensely deep immediately at the shoreline. Just off the shoreline, there are monstrously large sea creatures resembling otherworldly breeds of whales and sharks that appear to be dead, floating perfectly still and suspended in the deep, clear water. He adds some context for us and writes that he is a fledgling therapist who has recently experienced his first psychedelic <laughs> experience with ayahuasca, and he pursued that as a means of professional curiosity and inner exploration. And he adds that he is a veteran of the Iraq and Afghanistan war and also worked as a wildland firefighter. And undoubtedly that has affected his psyche. The main feelings in the dream are awe, horror, intrigue. And then he adds, it felt very foreign, as if I were in another world. Well, the first thing that comes up for me about this rather extraordinary dream is that he is perched high on a cliff. Yep. So he's really removed from this scene. And I think when we're in a great height in a dream, it can often uh, signal a kind of psychic distance. I was aware of that, too, and the contrast between high, uh, the dreamer's or dream ego's elevation, and low, uh, down below in the water, and consciousness and unconsciousness, land and sea, of the these opposites that are are separated, or the dream ego is separated. And so uh, here is the life of the water with these, quote, monstrously large sea creatures of, of dinosaur size uh, that appear to be dead, floating perfectly still in the water. So what does this say about um, what's going on in the unconscious, which is almost always what is is represented by the sea. It's one of those uh, symbols or images that has a universal meaning. It's the mother of all life, the sea. It's interesting that it immediately becomes deep. It's almost like the continental shelf mm -hmm. is right there at the shoreline. And uh, that's interesting to me. It makes me wonder about the ayahuasca experience. It's sort of like, did it just, he didn't wade in gradually. He went right into where it's very, very deep. I find myself thinking about the dream as compensation, the dream giving the thing that is not happening in the waking life. And I think about him standing high and objective, which suggests that much of the time he's in the water and swimming hard to stay afloat. If that's a compensation, that must be a relief. I also have a fantasy that I might be imposing, but because I work a lot with military, coming back from several tours as an active fighter in these settings, there are highly active leviathans that have been activated in the psyche. The leviathan, Jung thought of as the dark side of God, the terrifying, awful aspect of God, which we often hear described in the Old Testament, or even actually, as Deb had read earlier, Angel of the Lord appeared, and people were terrified by it. So there are aspects of the unconscious and of the spiritual experience that terrify us, horrify us, are so non-human that they are inexplicable in both their ancientness and their potency. So there's something here about the quietness and the distance that allows him to regard the Leviathans in a stillness, which may 
suggest there has been a healing around the hyperarousal that often veterans carry from having been in combat and enough of a pause that he can begin to regard the Leviathans that are part of his unconscious experience now. Mm -hmm. I really like and appreciate that, Joseph, of the relationship to his uh, lived life in embattled uh, situations in foreign, meaning uh, you know areas that are not familiar to us psychologically as well as geographically. And he was also a firefighter. So uh, he's been engaged with inner opposites of archetypal proportions, but in combative or oppositional ways. And the dream says they appear to be dead, floating perfectly still and suspended in the deep, clear water, which I think really sounds a hopeful note of the dream ego is not sure if they're alive, but we don't know for sure. And um, there's that sense of suspension, floating, and deep, clear water, which portends, in my optimistic uh, take on this, um, a different relationship with the unconscious. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, being a wildland firefighter, not something I have a whole lot of experience <laughs> with, but I have known people who have done that kind of work. And it's it's really, I mean, we're really talking about being immersed in a in a kind of archetypal world, really, to be a firefighter or a soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, and we are we are talking about um, encountering huge titanic titanic archetypal forces in those situations on kind of a daily basis. And I, I'm noticing that these are kind of otherworldly creatures, and he does mention dinosaurs. And so are they something very ancient? Are they from an ancient world? I have a kind of interest in cetacean uh, evolution, and there, there were these really fascinating uh, whales, and there was this wonderful arms race that took place between whales and sharks, actually, in the evolutionary sense, so that as the whales got bigger, so did the sharks, and that's where you get megalodon. That's what comes up for me, is that these might be very, very ancient contents, uh, truly kind of handed down ancestrally. And I noticed that he says he's a fledgling therapist. So he is obviously going through a career change, which would mean coming into a different relationship with these archetypal contents than he has experienced heretofore. And so I, I'm wondering, building on what both of you are saying about these creatures that are apparently dead in the water, is this about a shift in relating to them? I can hear in the dream if just my monsters would be still for a moment, I might be able to figure this out. Yeah, the, something uh, new seems to be coming online as he makes a life transition from being basically a warrior to a healer. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I liked what you said, Joseph, about regarding them of being able to look down from on high, maybe from an intellectual, uh, conscious, ego place. But that's a start. That's where we often start. Let me look at this. Uh, let me ponder it. And that something may just be in stasis, floating and suspended, that wants to come into being in some way. And I, I agree with what you said too, Lisa, about uh, these leviathans and um, primordial uh, ancient images of where is that in his psyche? And in all of our psyches. Yes, absolutely. When I think about people's reports of ayahuasca journeys, which, which I have not experienced, it's not just that the doors of the unconscious are thrown open but that there is a very deep and penetrating look into things, particularly because these retreats, for instance, down in Peru, 
often go on for many, many hours a day over many, many days, sometimes as long as 10 days. And people are in an ayahuasca experience for six, seven hours of each night. So the, the plummeting down is substantial and transformative, and I suspect very, very challenging. It calls up for me, uh, what is the right relationship? What is the right approach to the unconscious? You know, all of this, these sort of psychedelic plant medicines are affording all kinds of people, you know, opportunities to just, you know, burst through the gates of the unconscious. And what the preparation for that is, what the ritual container is, what the quest is, what one's readiness for it is, I think are all very important. And it can open up contents of the unconscious kind of prematurely and before ego is really ready to integrate them. So the feeling of awe, of horror and beauty Mm -hmm. that the ego feels sounds like the right stance, frankly. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.